The next section in your textbook um, talks about how skeletal muscles are named. So skeletal muscle names are based on the origin or the end of the muscle that stays stationary and the insertion or the end of the muscle that moves. Um, skeletal names are also based on the action, like what they do. And they're typically described as relative to the bone that's moved. So for example, flexation of the forearm. Or they could be described as the joint that's involved, so flexation at the elbow. Um, the prime mover or the agonist is the muscle that's responsible for producing a movement. Now, on the other hand, an and agonist, an antagonist, is a muscle that's going to oppose the agonist, um, not necessarily at the same time, but this would be the type of muscle that when it is contracted, then the prime mover would be elongated. Um, a great example is your biceps brachii and your triceps brachii, both muscles of your upper arm. And the biceps brachii will produce that flexation at the elbow, whereas the triceps brachii then produces extension at the elbow and in the process elongates the biceps brachii. Synergists are muscles that are going to help the agonist and so oftentimes you'll have muscles that work together in groups to accomplish a goal. Um, in that earlier example with the biceps brachii and the triceps brachii, a brachialis muscle would be the synergist to those two, to that biceps brachii. So this is a nice table from your textbook 7-3. It has some important muscle terminology that's going to be used throughout lecture and lab this semester. So take some time to familiarize yourself with these terms. Um, I won't go through all of them in this lecture recording, but um, some of them are going to have echoes of things we've learned before from previous chapters. For example, um, anterior, you'll see this part anterior in part of the names like for example the serratus anterior can be seen on the front side of the body or um, the vastus lateralis is a muscle on the leg um, on the quadriceps group that is on the side or on the lateral aspect of that leg um, also we have um, shapes like the deltoid you have a deltoid muscle that's on the top of your shoulder and that's that's its entire name is deltoid or uh, maybe orbicularis is a better example we have an orbicularis oculi which is a muscle that encircles the eye okay and so a lot of the names you'll find are very descriptive okay so when you familiarize yourself with these terms when you come across those terms in the name it'll help you to understand or find or locate um, what that muscle does or where it's located. So, this looks like a great table to make flashcards of. And so that's what anatomists do. They combine various terms from table 7-3 to name the muscles. So they'll use their location like lateralis or medialis. Um, they'll use their direction of the fibers like transversus abdominis. It's going to be a muscle that runs transverse to the midline. Um, or the numbers of origins, biceps and triceps, brachii are both good examples of that. Or their functions like flexors or extensors. So muscles are organized into two groups. We have the axial muscleizers, which are mostly stabilizers, and the appendicular muscles, which are either stabilizers or movers of the limbs. And this is a slide that has a picture very similar to our muscle man that we look at in lab, um, except this is more of the superficial muscles. Um, some of them have been cut away a little bit so that you can see better detail. Um, but some of the deeper muscles aren't visualized on here. So one of the things I would recommend is printing off this slide from the PowerPoint. And on one side have all the names like you see here, and then on the other side just delete all of those text boxes or delete all of the text and practice writing in the names, especially those that are in your lab manual that you're required to memorize for your lab practical. So this is the anterior view, and here we have the posterior view. Again, you can't see all of the muscles that we'll be studying on 
the muscle man in lab, but this is a very, very good start. And so we'll, we'll begin our tour of the muscles um, with the axial muscles, just like we did in the skeletal system. So we'll start with the muscles of the head and neck, move to the muscles of the spine, we'll talk about the muscles of the trunk, and then uh, end our axial muscles with the muscles of the pelvic floor. On these next two slides that I'm about to show you display muscles of the head and neck and these are exactly like the figures in your textbook. At the top left we have a kind of lateral view and the first um, that I want to point out to you is this epicranial aponeurosis which is just this sheet um, that is going to connect the frontalis muscle to the occipitalis muscle way back here. And so it kind of just spans the entire scalp um, or the head. So the frontalis muscle is responsible for raising the eyebrows, if you're wondering about the action there. One of the muscles we learn in lab is the orbicularis oculi, right here, that does close the eyes. The zygomaticus is the next muscle to point out, right here and right here, and this, this is the muscles that are responsible for a smile, your smile lifting the mouth. Now the orbicularis ori, okay, so similar, similar name, orbicularis ori, is going to be the muscle that constricts the mouth opening. Now on the anterior view over here, I want to point out the depressor Angulia oris, right here. It's a better view of it. You can see it here on both sides, and you can see it on this lateral view as well. Okay. And this is the muscles that are involved in a frown, so pulling your mouth down. That platysma has been cut away on this lateral view. You can see it in place here. Um, on the anterior view, the platysma is going to be the muscle that covers the ventral neck and extends from the base of the neck to the mandible. Next, I want to point out the temporalis muscle right here on the lateral view. You can see it on the anterior as well on both sides. The temporalis is used for chewing. The occipitalis, as I mentioned earlier, you can only see it on this particular view of the lateral view, is going to tense and retract the scalp. The buccinator is this muscle right here, and you can see a little bit of it down here as well. Here's a good view underneath the masseter. The buccinator right here is going to compress the cheeks like what you do when you blow forcefully. Okay. I pointed out the masseter. The masseter here and over here, this is one that you have to know for, for lab. The masseter is the prime mover for chewing. Another muscle for you to know from lab is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And it is on both sides. It is covered by the platysma on this side. Um, so the platysma has been pulled away so that you can have a better view of that sternocleidomastoid muscle. And this is going to rotate your head or flex your neck. The pterygoid muscles here, um, you can see them, some of the deeper muscles. These elevate, protract, and are responsible for lateral movement of the mandible. This view of the neck shows muscles underneath the platysma. Um, for example, the digastric, right here and right here, it kind of scoops. The digastric muscle um, depresses the mandible. 
is another good view of the sternocloidal mastoid muscle. You can really see how it um, articulates here with the sternum and the clavicle and why it gets its name then. And again, that rotates the head or flexes the neck. Um, so like when you put your chin to your chest or your ear to your shoulder, you're using your sternocleidal mastoid muscle. The mylohyoid, which has been cut right here, but the mylohyoid sheet here, you can see it being held up, uh, supports the tongue. The styloid, boy, isn't that a revealing name? Um, is going to articulate with the styloid process of the skull and the hyoid bone. You can see it there. The sternothyroid, right here, sternothyroid, and the sternohyoid, on the point two as well, it's been cut here, but you can see it all the way up here to the hyoid and down underneath the clavicle to the sternum. So the sternothyroid and the sternohyoid, those are going to depress the hyoid bone and the larynx. Next in the axial muscles are the muscles of the spine. One of the muscles for your lab to know is the splenus capitis. So you can see it here, splenus capitis. And right next to it, not required for your lab practical, but the semi-splinus capitis, the semi-spinalis capitis, those two are going to work together to either extend the head or tilt the head back. Now your erector spinae group here, this entire group, um, the erector spinae group um, are spinal extensors that include your spinalis, Right down here, spinalis, the longissimus here, okay, and the ilial costalis. Um, so and these are the ones that you would use uh, when you're going to extend your spine or like if you stretch and reach for the skies, you're going to be using all of your erector spinae muscles. Um, the quadrus lumbarum here, you can see, Quadratus lumborum, quadratus lumborum, is going to be used to flex the spinal column and depress the ribs. So when you bend down and touch your toes, you're going to be using your quadratus lumborum muscles. Let's take a look at some of the axial muscles of the trunk next. Okay. Your external obliques. Um, is one of the ones that you need to know for your lab practical. So it's all the way up to here and down to here. Um, you can see a transverse section of them here as the most superficial layer of your trunk. So these are going to be responsible for compressing the abdomen. They can flex the spine. And the aponeuroses, this, um, the whitish portion of the external obliques will connect then to the other side. So they've been cut away on this side so you can see the deeper muscles, but this aponeurosis is going to connect the two external obliques left and right sides. Um, the internal obliques, you can see over here, um, have been again cut away um, just ever so slightly on the aponeurosis. Um, but these are going to, again, be another sheet of muscles that will run at an oblique or at an angle to the midline. And you can see them here as then the second deeper layer of the abdominal core muscles. The rectus abdominis next is this group of muscles here, 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 and here. More commonly, your rectus abdominis are referred to as your six-pack, but they are responsible for depressing your ribs and flexing the spine. The internal intercostals, um, not a super great picture here. You can see um, at a higher transverse section, the 
external intercostals and internal intercostals um, are labeled here for you. Um, on this guy, they are right next to each other, internal, and then covering the rib then is the external intercostals. Both are in between the ribs, which is why they get their name intercostal, inter meaning between, and costal meaning ribs. But the internal intercostals are going to depress the ribs and the external intercostals are going to elevate the ribs. So you'll be using your external intercostals when you're really working out hard and you actually need to um, expand and then depress, depress so that you can exhale quickly, um, depress your ribs. So. Mm -hmm. Let's see, oh, the diaphragm, of course, um, is pictured here. And you can see how it kind of, um, if you use your imagination in lab, it kind of looked like when you remove the liver and the stomach, like you were looking at the upside or the underside of an umbrella. So this diaphragm is a big sheet of muscle. And what it does is it, it does divide the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity, but it's used for inhalation, um, especially when you're doing performing passive breathing. This figure shows the muscles of the pelvic floor, um, which form the perineum and support the organs of the pelvic cavity. They do flex the coccyx and they control materials moving through the anus and urethra with their sphincters. Which brings us to another checkpoint, and I'll stop the recording here so that the appendicular muscles are in the next recording. But see if you could answer these questions on your own time.